Years ago, some researchers decided to see if seminary students were good Samaritans. So they met individually with 40 seminary students under the pretext of doing research on their careers. They met with each of the students and they said, you need to cross the street, go across the street from this building to the next building, and there in a room you'll find a tape recorder in which you need to give an impromptu talk about something. They were given the topic to talk on either the Good Samaritan, that parable, or they could talk on their careers. Well, these researchers had planted an actor along the way whose job was when each seminarian would be walking to the other, across to the other building to give his talk, he would fall down on the ground in front of them moaning like he was in great need. Guess what the researchers found? Barely half of the seminarians stopped to help that actor. In fact, some of them whose talk, impromptu talk, was on the parable of the Good Samaritan, were so preoccupied with thinking about what they had to talk that they actually stepped over the man to get to the other building. Now you're probably thinking like me, right? How could those seminarian students have, be so preoccupied with what's going on in their life that they had no compassion? But stop and think about it. Isn't it true that you and I, we can get so preoccupied with our cares and our concerns that we miss showing compassion to those around us too? Jesus never had that problem. He always showed compassion in his ministry. If you look back at verse 35, we get a description of what Jesus' ministry was like. Jesus went through all the towns and villages doing what? Teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news, and healing every disease and sickness. But did you notice? There was something that caught Jesus' attention. There was something he saw as he did that. Look at verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What did Jesus see? People who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. If you go to the North Park area of Colorado by Walden, you'll see many ranches that have sheep on them. Can you picture one of those sheep up there harassed? It's nighttime, and a bear has just come out of hibernation, and it's hungry, and it's smelling fresh mutton. It dives into the flock of sheep, and they scatter. One takes off, and the bear's chasing it. It's dark, it's running, it's going through thistles, it's going through thorns, it's all torn up, chunks of flesh are torn from its body. That's being harassed. But it gets worse, it's also helpless. The shepherd. He hears the commotion. He knows a bear is chasing his sheep, but he's too warm and comfortable in his sleeping bag to get out and help them. So he just leaves the sheep. That's being helpless. That's being abandoned. Can you imagine having the Ten Commandments shoved in front of your face every day as the only thing that's going to get you to heaven is if you obey every one of those commandments? And can you imagine having a subset of 39 other rules that define how you got to keep each of those commandments? For example, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day, doesn't just mean that you shouldn't do any work on that day, but they had 39 other rules like how many steps you could take on that day, how many letters you could punch in on your iPhone that day to talk to somebody? Talk about being harassed and helpless. They had 613 rules like that that they held in front of your face that you better keep all of them to get to heaven. Otherwise, you are going to be damned to hell. 
And they were helpless too. Because when the people, the Jews, cried out to their religious leaders and said, we can't do that. Instead of bringing them the comfort of God's word from Isaiah and Jeremiah, they just left them. They abandoned them. That's what the Pharisees and the religious rulers did to the Jews of Jesus' time. They were helpless. They were harassed. They were sheep without a shepherd. Let me ask you a question. Has the guilt of your sin ever left your conscience in tatters? If you think about it, the society we live in, our own self, and Satan, they act just like the Pharisees and those religious rulers, right? Have you been a good parent? Have you been the kind of husband or wife you're supposed to be? Have you been the kind of child you should be? Do people like you at school? Are you popular? You see, society has these, this standard that we're all supposed to live up to, their standard. And, and if you don't live up to that standard, you're, you're less than what you should be. Society and its idea of who we should be can leave us in tatters, lead us feeling harassed. And then our own self comes when we, when we do have failings as a husband or a wife or a parent or a child or a friend, whatever it is, then our own self comes in there and says, well, maybe i got to make it up to God next week. i got to do better next week. i got to be that perfect whatever. But we can't do that. And so we're left helpless. Or Satan comes in and he does the opposite, right? When we look at our failures to living up to that perfect standard we heard about in the, gospel, or the reading from Romans, Satan comes in and says, you did what? You committed what sin? How can you call yourself a Christian if you did that? Does that describe you in any way? Harassed? and helpless, left in tatters because of the guilt of our sin? What's Jesus' answer to sheep without a shepherd who are harassed and helpless? He sends out his 12 disciples with the simple message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Freely you have received, freely give. What had Jesus' disciples freely received? Wasn't it Jesus himself? The gift of Christmas, the babe born in Bethlehem who grew up and lived a holy, perfect life in their place and on Good Friday gave himself up for them and on Easter rose from the dead. Wasn't the gift they freely received forgiveness, full and free, from all those sins that harassed their conscience? Wasn't the gift they received Jesus who did it all because they were helpless to do anything? But maybe we'll get a better appreciation for this gift of forgiveness if we actually look at who received the gift. Think about Jesus' 12 disciples whom he said, you have freely received forgiveness from me. Let's take the inner three, Jesus' favorites, right? Peter, James, and John, weren't those the only three that went on the Mount of Transfiguration? They were the special ones? Don't you think that had a little problem for their pride? Wasn't it the mother of James and John that asked Jesus if, could my son sit on the right and left hand side in your kingdom? Wasn't Peter the one who said, hey, all these other schmuck disciples are going to fall away from you, but not me. You see the sin of pride that crept into their lives? Yet Jesus freely forgives them of their sin of pride, and he uses them in his kingdom. Or what about Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot? In John 14, 22, we're told that Thaddeus asked Jesus, are we only going to see you and not the whole world? He and Simon were zealots. They were Jewish nationalists. All they wanted wasn't a spiritual Messiah. They wanted a physical Messiah to give them this wonderful heaven on earth. Yet they freely received forgiveness for their sin of worldliness, and God used them for their kingdom. Oh, and then what about the criminal, Matthew? 
Yeah, that's what tax collectors were, criminals who stole from other people selfishly. Yet God freely forgave Matthew his sin of selfishness and stealing, used him for his kingdom. Oh, and then there was Bartholomew. You know him better as Nathaniel. Remember the one who said about Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yet he freely received forgiveness for his doubting, skeptical faith. And God uses him for his kingdom work. And then there's Judas Iscariot, right? Well, he had a problem. He had an addiction. Money. Maybe gambling was his problem. I don't know. Yet Jesus freely forgave him his, love of money, his sin of love for money and used him for his kingdom. Which one is you? Which one is me? Are you Peter, James, and John? Do you struggle with me with pride? Or, or maybe your problem is, is like Thaddeus, worldliness. You get too caught up in this world. Don't have a lot of time for God and serving him. Or is your crime like Matthew's selfishness? You, you just worry about yourself? Or maybe... You have holes in your faith. You doubt and are skeptical about some things God says in the Bible, like Nathaniel. Or maybe you have that pet sin, a sin of weakness, sin of addiction that you constantly struggle with. What's the sin that you are harassed by that leaves you feeling helpless? You are freely forgiven of those sins. Freely you have received forgiveness from your sins. Don't harass yourself thinking, well, man, I've got to make it up to God next week for all these sins I've done. Don't let Satan leave you feeling helpless like, well, I must not be a Christian headed for heaven because look at what I've done. That's not true. The dividing line between heaven and hell, it is not sin. We all have sin. The dividing line between heaven and hell is belief in Jesus, faith. And you have faith because faith, too, is a gift given to you by God. If you have faith, you have forgiveness of all your sins, no matter what they have been. Freely, you have received, haven't you? So Jesus says, freely, now, give. Instead of being like those seminary students who were too preoccupied with what's going on in their own life to take time to show compassion for somebody, we freely give the compassion Jesus has given to us, right? And, and Jesus even guides us how to do that. He says, don't go among the Gentiles or enter a town of the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Showing compassion starts close to home with our families, doesn't it? Parents, when you get home today, talk with your children about the word of God you heard. Ask them, what are the things that leave you feeling harassed and helpless in your life? Talk to them about how having freely received from God forgiveness in heaven, how does that change your perspective? Spouses, Freely you have received forgiveness. Freely give it to each other. When you've sinned against each other and want to withhold that forgiveness. And kids, parents aren't perfect either. Freely you've received forgiveness. Freely forgive your parents when they've not been perfect either. But it also goes to our other family, doesn't it? Our family of faith. Maybe it's that member who broke his leg and can't mow the lawn. Freely give. Maybe it's that member who's had a miscarriage and just needs a note to cheer her up. And the list goes on and on, right? Freely we've received from Jesus. Freely we show compassion. Rejoice. Just think of it. Rejoice that we're used as containers of Jesus' compassion for others. Isn't that incredible? Just like the disciples were with all our flaws. But rejoice even more greatly that you have freely received compassion from Christ. If Jesus didn't love you, 
if Jesus hadn't forgiven you, if Jesus doesn't love you now and doesn't forgive you now, then you wouldn't be sitting here hearing God's word, worshiping your Lord and Savior, and soon to receive his sacrament, would we? Amen.